when Ronald Fisher offered a colleague a cup of tea that afternoon. He was just being polite. It was the 1920s in England. What could be more chummy than a nice cup of tea? Fisher had no idea he was about to kick up a big fight. And he had even less of an idea that his simple offer of tea was going to help remake modern science. But sometimes, that's just how history works. The smallest, most inconsequential thing ends up being revolutionary. Hi, I'm Sam Keen, and you're listening to The Disappearing Spoon, a topsy-turvy, sciency history podcast, where footnotes become the real story. In the early 1920s, Ronald Fisher worked at an agricultural research station north of London. He was a short, slight mathematician with rounded glasses, one of those people who never looks more than about 15 years old his whole adult life. He'd been hired to help scientists there design better experiments, but he wasn't making much headway. The station's four o'clock tea breaks were actually a nice distraction. One afternoon, Fisher fixed a cup for an algae biologist named Muriel Bristol. He knew that she took milk with tea, so he poured some milk into a cup and added the tea to it. That's when the trouble started. Bristol refused the cup. I won't drink that, she declared. Fisher was taken aback. Why, he asked. Because you poured the milk into the cup first, she said. She explained that she never drank tea unless the milk went in second. Now, the milk first, tea first debate has been a bone of contention in England ever since tea first arrived there in the mid-1600s. This might sound like the ultimate silly spat. Like that Dr. Seuss book about the war between the creatures who butter their bread on top versus those who butter their bread on the bottom. Then again, why don't we ask the British how they feel? Each side has its partisans who get boiling mad if someone makes a cup the wrong way. No less than George Orwell himself, that paragon of Englishness, once weighed in on this matter. He declared that only a fool would pour the milk in first, but millions of people disagree with him. One newspaper in London recently suggested, if anything is going to kick off another civil war in the UK, it is probably going to be this. As a man of science, Fisher thought the debate was nonsense. It's simple thermodynamics. Mixing A with B was the same as mixing B with A. The final temperature and relative amounts of each would be identical, so how could it possibly be different? And that's exactly what he told his colleague. Surely the order doesn't matter. It does, she insisted. She even claimed she could taste the difference between a milk-first cup and a tea-first cup. Fisher scoffed. That's impossible. Now, this might have gone on for some time, if not for one tiny, all-too-human thing. A crush. There happened to be a third colleague there, watching this debate. Chemist William Roach. Roach was actually in love with Bristol and would eventually marry her. He wanted to defend her from Fisher and his skepticism, so he decided to step in. But Roach wasn't the fist-fighting type, and as a scientist himself, he couldn't just declare that his beloved was right. He'd need evidence. So he came up with a plan. Let's run a test, he said. We'll make some cups each way and see if Muriel can taste which cup is which. Bristol declared that she was game. She wasn't going to back down. Fisher was also enthusiastic. But given his background designing experiments, he wanted the test to be precise. He proposed making eight cups of tea. Four would be milk first, and four would be tea first. They'd present them to Bristol in random order and let her guess. Bristol agreed to this. So Roach and Fisher disappeared to make the tea. By this point, some other scientists had gathered in the tea room for their breaks. And of course, once they heard what was going on, they had to stick around. They wanted to see whether Bristol actually knew her stuff. A few minutes later, Fisher and Roach returned to their small audience. Now, some of the details here have been lost to history. We don't know the exact order the cups were presented, for instance. But as for the outcome of the experiment, well, no one would ever forget that. Bristol sipped the first cup and smacked her lips. Then she made her judgment. Perhaps she said, milk first. They handed her a second cup. Tea first, she said. 
This happened six more times. Tea first, milk first, milk first again. By the eighth cup, Fisher was goggle-eyed behind his spectacles. Thank you. Bristol had gotten every single one correct. How? Well, it turns out that adding tea to milk is not the same as adding milk to tea, for good old chemistry reasons. No one knew it at the time, but milk contains certain fats and proteins that are hydrophobic or water-hating. And when those water-hating proteins and fats in milk encounter water, they curl up into tight little balls to minimize contact. In particular, when you pour milk into boiling hot tea, the first drops of milk that splash down get divided and isolated. When those tiny bits are isolated, they're much more likely to get scalded. And scalded whey proteins change shape. That's important because a change of shape results in a change of flavor. Specifically, the proteins acquire a burnt caramel flavor. If you've ever been to Europe and had ultra-high temperature pasteurized milk, that's the flavor you might have noticed. It tastes a bit off to Americans, but it's a simple consequence of raising the temperature past a certain point. So that's pouring milk into tea. In contrast, if you do the opposite and pour tea into milk, something different happens. If you pour tea into milk, the milk drops never get isolated. So there's almost zero scalding, and there's little production of off flavors. As for whether milk first or tea first tastes better, well, that depends on your palate. But Bristol's intuition was correct. The chemistry of milk ensures that each whey tastes distinct. Back in the tea room, Bristol's triumph proved a little humiliating for Fisher. He was proven wrong in the most public way possible. But the important part of the whole experiment is what happened next. Afterward, Fisher was embarrassed, and he wondered whether Muriel had simply gotten lucky. Maybe she'd just guessed correctly all eight times. Admittedly, this was a little petulant of him. But then he worked out the math for this possibility, and he realized that the odds of her guessing right all eight times in a row were just one in 70. So she probably could taste the difference. But even then, he couldn't stop thinking about the experiment. What if she'd made a mistake at some point? For example, what if she'd switched two cups around, incorrectly identifying a tea-first cup as a milk-first cup and vice versa? He reran the numbers and found that the odds of her guessing correctly in that case dropped from 1 in 70 huh, to around 1 in 4. In other words, if she'd missed just once, odds were good she could still probably taste the difference. But Fisher would have been much less confident in his conclusions. And what was really intriguing was that Fisher could quantify exactly how much less confident he'd be. He could put a number on it. Furthermore, that lack of confidence told Fisher something, that the sample size was too small. He should have made her try more cups. So he began running some more numbers and found that 12 cups of tea with six each way would have been a better experiment. Each individual cup would have carried less weight in that case, so one data point wouldn't skew things so much. And as he thought more about it, other variations of the experiment occurred to him as well. For example, he could use random numbers of tea-first or milk-first cups. He explored these different possibilities over the next few months. Now, this might all sound like a waste of time. After all, Fisher's boss wasn't paying him to dink around in the tea room. But the more Fisher thought about it, the more the tea work seemed important. You see, in the 1920s, there was no standard way to design a scientific experiment. People rarely had controls, and most scientists analyzed data pretty crudely. Fisher had been hired to design better experiments, and he realized that the tea test pointed the way. However frivolous it seemed, the simplicity of the test clarified his thinking. It allowed him to isolate the key points of good experimental design and good statistical analysis. He could then apply what he'd learned in this simple case to messier, real-world examples, like isolating the effects of fertilizer or weather on crop production. Fisher published the fruit of his research in two highly influential books. One of them, The Design of Experiments, introduced several fundamental ideas that scientists worldwide still use today. These include the null hypothesis and the idea of statistical significance. And the very first example in that book to set the tone for everything that followed was Muriel Bristol's tea test. Now, all this would be pretty cool by itself. How an afternoon tea revolutionized modern science, secretly influencing how every lab in the world works today. But there's another lesson lurking here 
one that's a bit painful to acknowledge, since it strikes at a sore spot of modern science. It involves a so-called replication crisis in psychology. Over the past decade, dozens of gee whiz studies in psychology have been exposed as bogus. One study found that viewing pictures of old people supposedly made you walk more slowly afterward. Another found that exposing people to disgusting odors made them judge other people's actions more harshly. Ew. That physical disgust led to moral disgust. Ugh. These were all pretty cool stories. Neat little insights into how the human brain worked. They got hyped up in the media and passed around endlessly. Unfortunately, when other labs tried to replicate these results years later, they failed. They ran the same basic experiment but couldn't get the same results. It seems likely there was nothing there to begin with. And it's not just in psychology. Medicine has been rocked by a similar scandal in that several important studies on human health couldn't be replicated by other labs. Scientists are still trying to come to grips with what went wrong. But we can trace much of the problem right back to Fisher in the tea room. Most of the dubious studies had very small sample sizes, for instance, something that Fisher had warned about. Fisher was also clear that his statistical test didn't prove anything. You had to run experiments several times, independently, and use your judgment to see if the results made sense. But Fisher's work was so influential that scientists forgot his caution. They ran their numbers, and if they passed Fisher's test for statistical significance even once, they considered this absolute proof and hurried to publish. As a result, many scientists ended up reproducing the very problems Fisher was trying to fix. They had poorly designed experiments with small, unrepresentative samples, and they misinterpreted their own data. Science could have saved itself a lot of trouble in the long run by paying a little closer attention to that afternoon tea test. After his stint at the Agricultural Research Station, Fisher would go on to become highly influential in biology. His most notable achievement was helping to unite the gene theory of monk Gregor Mendel with the evolutionary theory of Charles Darwin. Unfortunately, to his discredit, Fisher also got entangled in the vile eugenics movement, and like many people then, said some pretty nasty things. But his biggest contribution to science remains his work on experimental design. We haven't always heeded his lessons, but the reforms he introduced are so ubiquitous, so widespread, they're all but invisible nowadays the sign of a true revolution. Not bad for a guy who couldn't even make a proper cup of tea. To learn more, visit samkeen.com slash podcast. There, you can find more incredible stories from my books or learn how to book me as a speaker at your school or event. Also, you can ask questions for me to answer on air or suggest stories for future episodes. Finally, you can learn how to find transcripts, bonus episodes, and signed goodies there by becoming an official supporter. And if you like this podcast, please do your part to keep it alive by becoming a patron through samkeen.com slash podcast. I'm listener supported. Spread the word to others as well, both online and in person. Word of mouth means a lot. Also, subscribe in iTunes, Stitcher, or other places and leave a five-star review. Thanks for listening to The Disappearing Spoon.